Now, I want to encourage you to turn with me, please, to uh, Acts chapter 7, and let's begin reading. This is Stephen's defense. Now, at the end of chapter 6, which we looked at last week, remember, he was accused of of, uh, heresy and blasphemy, speaking against the temple, speaking against the sacrificial system, the law of Moses, speaking against Moses, and thus speaking against God as well, because all of these were um, um, representatives of God in the Jewish mind. And so he's brought before the Sanhedrin, and he's being accused, and verse 1, the Bible says, and the high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen responds by not exactly answering the question directly as he begins his defense. And he says, brothers and fathers, hear me, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Now, what is he doing? Right off the bat, he's giving glory to God. He's acknowledging that God is glorious, that there's none like him, that no other deserves the glory like God deserves the glory. What is he trying to communicate? He's trying to communicate that Christianity is not anti-Semitic. I need to say that again. Christianity is not anti-Semitic. Our Savior was Jewish. And he is pushing back against this idea that these Christians are against the descendants of Abraham. And we are not. We share the faith of Abraham. And we pray for those who are the seed of Abraham. And one day God says he will save them and bring them to himself. And so Stephen begins by giving God glory and saying it aloud so that he can put to rest this idea that Christianity is somehow against uh, the children of Abraham. And when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, reading on, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Remember, Abraham and his family, they were entirely pagan. Uh, They were not God-fearers, and yet God chose to get Abraham's attention, to introduce himself to Abraham, to call Abraham to faith in him. And and then in verse 4, then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. Now, what is he talking about there? Well, the Jews thought they were very special. They had God's law. Uh, They were the children of Abraham. God's land, their land, their possession, and they considered to be sacred, and and then the temple. And so these are the things that they equated with being able to be justified and accepted before holy God. So he is acknowledging this, and he's reminding them that Abraham was given an inheritance that he believed God for even though he never possessed it himself, with the exception of a little bit of land that he purchased to bury his wife. What did Abraham do? He believed that God would keep his promise. And he believed that if I don't walk on this land and possess it myself, there will come a time when my children, my offspring will do so, and they did. And God spoke in verse 6, and God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years, okay, but I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after they shall come out and worship me in this place. The covenant with Abraham is very clear. God said to him, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And you can look across the landscape of humankind history since Israel came into being a nation, and you can see that promise being carried out. My friend, that is a promise that God still keeps today. And in our own country, we better be very, very careful how we choose to relate to Israel, how we think about Israel, and how we support Israel. And there are those now in both parties who espouse the idea that maybe we support Israel too much. Maybe we should back up. Maybe there's another side to the story. Not if you want God's blessing and don't want to become crossed with Him. It's important to keep this in mind. The Bible says, but I will judge the nation that they serve, said God. After that, they shall come out and worship me in this place. 
and he gave them the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. Now here, what is happening? First of all, we see the charges that Stephen faced. He was accused of blasphemy, speaking against Moses, the law of Moses, speaking against the temple, uh, speaking against, really, um, the whole idea of, of the special relationship that God had with the descendants of Abraham. And what they were doing is they were taking bits and pieces of what Stephen was saying as he was, relay, as he was relating to others there in the temple about the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they would take a little shred of it, of that is true, wrap it in a lie, and pawn it off as the real thing. These were the false charges that he was facing today, and these are the same false charges that as Christians we encounter in social media today and in the news media and in the classroom and academia. I'll take a little part of what is true in God's Word, wrap it in a lie, exaggerate it in a way and misconstrue it in a way that God never said, never intended, and turn that back around as an accusation against us. It's happened before. It will happen again. I believe it's happening now. And then number two, the defense that Stephen presented. That's what he's doing right now in verses 2 through 50. He's presenting his defense. Reading on in verse 9, And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his affliction and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt uh, and, and over all of his household. Who is he talking about? He's now talking about Joseph. Now there came a famine throughout all of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction with our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers for the first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family finally became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob his father and all of his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had brought, bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamar in Shechem. But as the time of the promise drew near which God granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. Remember, let's kill all of the newborn baby Jewish boys. Population control was Pharaoh's plan, but the midwives who feared God would not go along with it, and so the people continued to increase. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house, and when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son, and Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds." Now, a couple of things there that we need to reflect upon and think about. In this defense that Stephen is giving, being falsely accused, he right off the bat in the immediate opening of the chapter gives glory to God, acknowledges the God of glory of Abraham. He's our God. He's the one true God. Christianity is not against the Israel. Uh, it's not against the seed of Abraham. In fact, Jesus is the completion of the law of Moses. He is the fulfillment of the of the prophetical picture of animal sacrifice. Remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus at the Jordan River? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, God's ultimate sacrifice for the forgiveness of all of our sin. And so he starts with the history of Israel, beginning with Abraham, and then he moves to Moses, and then he, or Joseph, and now he moves to Moses. Now what is interesting is Joseph and Moses, in each their own way, they are a type of Christ, a picture of Christ in the Old Testament. They're not Christ, but they are a picture of Christ, who He would be and what He would be like. And so, reading on, the Bible says in verse 23, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. Now, let me stop here. The previous verse, the Bible says that he was mighty in his words and deeds. Does anyone remember what Moses said at the burning bush? when um, he was about, what, about 80 years old at that time, and God said, go back to Pharaoh, and he said, I don't know, really know how to talk. I, ca I can't speak well. He said, well, I'll send Aaron to speak for you. Well, what had happened to Moses? 
I mean, he was a prince of Egypt. Surely he was mighty in words and deeds before he went to the backside of the desert, but he was down. He didn't think he was much of anything. Here he is working for his father-in-law, taking care of a bunch of smelly sheep and goats on the backside of the Midian Desert. And yet we know later on that Moses would speak boldly and clearly of his own, not always having to go through Aaron. So in time, that which Moses was as a prince of Egypt, he exceeded that for God as the lawgiver and as the leader of Israel, speaking clearly, thus saith the Lord. So he became again that mighty man in words and in deeds by the power of God. Verse 24, and seeing one of them being wrong, remember, he descended, uh, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brothers would understand what God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. He thought, hey, since I'm going to be the leader of my people, I might as well go ahead and give God a hand. I don't see anything happening. Have you ever got in trouble by trying to give God a hand, by trying to give a, get ahead of God, by trying to do it your own way? And, and instead of waiting on the Lord, instead of seeking God, instead of humbly following His Word, you, because you feel that this is the way it should be, you pursue something that is not God's will or God's time for you. Well, that's what happened to Moses. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them. Now, speaking of, of Hebrews, men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And at this retort, Moses fled and became in exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Interesting. Here he is, Jewish, and he takes a Gentile wife, and what a beautiful picture that is of the fact that the gospel is not limited only to Jews. It is also for us as Gentiles, of which almost all of us, surely most of us are. And aren't we thankful that the bride of Christ includes Gentiles and Jews? Praise the Lord for the power of His gospel. Reading on, notice what the Bible says. Now, when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Okay, Stephen's still going over the history of Israel. In a flame of fire, in a bush. And when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. And then the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning and I've come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. Holy ground. The idea of holiness is something that is being lost in too many churches in the lives of too many Christians. We tend to think that it's prudish or it's overly religious. When God only uses the word holy to describe himself three times in a row in the Bible. That doesn't happen anywhere else where Isaiah said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. If you wanted to underscore something in Judaism that was important, in very important, that you wanted to pay attention to, that you didn't want to forget, then you would say it three times in a row. And yes, God is love, and God is just, and God is pure, and God is righteous, and God is good, but God is holy, holy, holy completely separated from sin, separated from the fall of man, separated from this fallen world, separated from this fallen creation. In fact, God says that we should be holy as He is holy. And if you are a Christian, then the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Paul says our bodies have become temples of the Holy Spirit. And so the question is, how am I displaying holy God empowered by the Holy Spirit in my life. And I'm ta talking about just being in church on Sunday, and God bless you for being here. But the truth is, holiness is not between 10.30 and 11.30 on a Sunday morning at First Roanoke. Holiness should be a lifestyle. It should be a way that you live, a way that you speak, a way that you talk, a way that you think, a way that you process disappointment and happiness. It's all filtered through who you are. If you have been bought by the blood of God's Son, 
If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have for, sought Him for the forgiveness of your sins and are trusting in Him for your salvation, you then are to be a holy man or woman. The question is, are we seeking even to be mindful of this in the way that we live today? I fear for many in the church, they are not. Notice what the Bible says beginning in verse uh, 35. This Moses whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? Who else did they reject? They re rejected Jesus. And he's setting them up, because look what he's going to say in just a few verses from now. This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. Who is Jesus to be in your life, Christian? He is your redeemer. He is your ruler. That's what we mean when we say receive Christ as the Lord of our lives. This man led them out in performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation, the wilderness, with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai. And with our fathers, he received living oracles to give to us. You see, he's giving the history of Israel in a flyover. Verse 39, our fathers refused to obey him and thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt. Which way are you turning, Christian friend? Are you turning to heaven? Are you turning to Christ? Are you turning to following Him? Or have you said, it's too hard, and I'm too tired, and I've got too many friends that would rather do something else, and you have begun to turn back to Egypt because it's easy, because it's available, because that's what's convenient, or maybe that's what you are still in your flesh most comfortable with. No wonder we're struggling sometimes living a holy life. We're not turning towards God. We're turning back to Egypt, representing our own flesh and sinful carnal attitudes and natures. Reading on, notice what the Bible says. Saying to Aaron, look what they did, turning back to Egypt, Make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets. They were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Following holy God was too much of a challenge Let's make our own God and call Him good enough. Work with our own hands. It is so important for us to remember and not to forget that when we come to God, we come on His terms, not ours. When we come to God, we come by the only way that is available to us to come, and that is through Jesus Christ. And there is no other way. Christ told us this. It said they were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Sometimes as Christians, we can be guilty of this as well. We'll take such pride in something we've done, something that we've built, something that we think we've accomplished, when the truth is we can't do anything that's truly good and spiritual unless God does it through us, with us, and by Him. When you think about the Christian gospel, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it is not about your works that you are most interested in talking about. It is about the work of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and what He has done for you on Calvary's cross. That's what Christianity talks about and rejoices in, the work of Jesus. Reading on, look what the Bible says. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up, uh, you took up the tent of Molech and, and the star uh, uh, of your god Rephim, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. It wasn't just they turned back to Egypt. It wasn't that they just made gods with their own hands. They began following the false gods of their pagan neighbors. Uh, our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness. 
talking about the fact they had no excuse. They had the tent as a witness. Our fathers, in turn, brought it with Joshua when he disposed of the nations, and God drove out before our fathers. Uh, So it was until that day of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, to the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool, says the Lord. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or when, where is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all of these things? Let us remember, where does God dwell? Does God hang out in this room when the last Christian leaves? Does the Holy Spirit just kind of settle in and wait till we come back? No. When the last Christian walks out the door, so does the Holy Spirit walk out with that Christian, that child of God. That's why the Bible says that our bodies have become temples of the Holy Spirit. The sacrifice that Stephen offered. You stiff-necked people, God says, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. You hear what, you see what Stephen has done? He's talked about the history of Israel. He's talked about how Moses and Joseph are, are types of Christ. He's talked about how they have elevated and worshiped the temple. They've worshiped uh, uh, the fact of their own um, uh, lineage and connection uh, as, as the children, descendants of Abraham. They've worshiped the sacrificial system. And, and yet now he's talking about the fact that just as your fathers persecuted the prophets, who did what? Who pointed and announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Wow! Talk about bold preaching. You who had received his law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Uh, Reading on, notice what the Bible says. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. And but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What is interesting about that is in Matthew chapter 26 and Colossians chapter 3, Jesus is described as being seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, God the Father's Spirit, what does it mean by the right hand of God? That's describing the divine authority of Jesus. Remember what Jesus said, all authority has been given to me both in heaven and earth. And so he sees Jesus not sitting, but what does Jesus do as the first martyr is about to be welcomed home to heaven? He stands to welcome Stephen, and he allows Stephen to see him standing just then. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. It's like little children putting their fingers in their ears and saying, la, 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 I don't want to hear. They they stopped their ears. They refused to hear, would not consider. Don't bother me with the truth. Don't bother me with my nation's history. Don't bother me with the Old Testament. Remember, the Old Testament is the only scripture that Stephen has, and yet he is putting out for them and explaining to them how Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the prophets, how Moses and Joseph were the type of Christ pointing to the righteous one. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open in the Son of Man. Where does that phrase sound familiar? That is one of Jesus' favorite ways of referring to himself in the Gospels. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Remember from Tarsus, the synagogue of the freedmen? I believe... I believe, I can't show you a chapter or verse, but it is likely that Saul was in the synagogue, followed the arrest of Stephen, and there held the robes and cloaks of those as Stephen was being stoned to death. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 
And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And that's a biblical way to refer to a Christian's death. How should we live, having read this morning Stephen's sermon, as bold witnesses unto a hostile world? Well, let me, let me offer just three things to keep in mind, and we'll close. Number one, seek to love God more than your own life. Choose to forgive others no matter how they have wronged you. You want to be a bold witness? You can't carry grudges. And that starts within the body of Christ in your own church family. Be prepared to see the Lord when you die. This old world is going to one day come to an end faster than you ever imagined. And yes, that might happen with the end days, but it will happen with your days and my days. And we think it's way out there when the truth is a lot of us have lived over half our lives. We have a lot less time to spend in this place ahead of us than what we've spent in this place, this old world behind us. What are we doing? Are we stopping up our ears? Are we wanting to try to justify a reason to live by staying worked up over things that aren't worth a hill of beans in God's sight? Or are we willing to love God so much that we want to forgive others even as He has forgiven us in an effort to be ready to see Him face to face and be used by Him until then to be a bold witness for others whom he loves just as much as you.